So, Benita, um, maybe if we can start with, because I know you've, you've started to talk about the work that you're doing by starting with these three things, which are things that you think are really useful to think about when, when people are dealing with situations above a certain level of complexity. So one of them is to organize in a different way. And here we can obviously start to talk about OPO and what that is and isn't. And the second one is about lowering the threshold for action. And the third one is about sense making up hierarchies. So maybe you could say a little bit about those three things and then we can dive into them in a bit more detail and sort of go with the flow from there. Yeah, I'm glad you started started with that framing because it's the kind of framing I like to work with so people kind of know where are we going with all of this, right? So it is actually inclusive of the larger picture of my work. And it's exactly um, how succinct that you put it. So it's always above a certain level of complexity, right? So, you know, there's many things in our life that we do that are not co that complex. Um, there's, um, if you're fortunate enough not to have a complex business and it's doing well, um, there's no need to search for more subtle or nuanced or um, more complex systems thinking. So it's always above a certain level of of complexity, but of course we know that even the quote unquote simplest companies are steeped in global markets and global supply chains. And um, just even if you're just a local market and a local supply chain, the media that we use is the internet and there's a lot of com complexity in terms of competing for people's attention and stuff like that. So most, um, businesses can take a great deal um, from this notion of above a certain level of complexity. And then finally, there's also complexity in the human system. So even if you're running a local uh, bakery, um, the human system itself is, is quite complex. So certainly that's the, the framing. And, and so uh, when you reach this threshold of complexity, there's in my work, there's three bullet points. The first is to organize in a way in which your human system is sensing as much information, as much cues in the environment as it can. And so you can draw from that. So you get the sense that you've organized in such a way that the humans would, are what Dave Snowden calls a human sensing network, like a big satellite, right? That's that's getting cues, early detection cues in the environment. So the OPO, Open Participatory Organization, is kind of a platform or a handbook or a toolkit to experiment with ways of organizing toward that goal, right? More open, so you get more information in, um, more participation, so that even when your employees are you know, not at their desk and they're in their home life, they can listen for cues that may be signals that are important for their work, you know? So this, this notion of um, organizing to sense more so you can make sense of what's going on better. And that's the OPO work proper, um, the organizational development um, or design work. The second bullet is um, lower the thresholds for action. So once you're capable of detecting early cues, you kind of get a sense of what's going on. And I'll give you a, a real life example of these three after we, we outline them. Uh, but once you sense it, once you have people getting a sense of early cues, you want a way for that to turn into action, to turn into response. It doesn't make any sense to get all this subtle information if then it has to go through analysis and the complex decision path and reports and documents and contracts and sign off, by then it's too late. So you need to be able to lower the thresholds for action. Uh, uh, you could say empower employees. This is one of the ways we talk about that. And the third thing is, if you just do those two things, you have a tendency that you've got everybody going out in all kinds of directions, <laughs> right? You, it, it's really like, if you're listening to this and you're an owner of a company 
you know, you can, I can, I can feel how nervous you might get. <laughs> and so as you build those two capacities, you need to build information flows such that the local actions are interpreted into the larger and larger contexts, right? So that, that yes, people are empowered. Yes, they're, they're interpreting cues, but what is the larger context? So that's the up hierarchy. How do we make up sense into larger and larger context up to the organizational whole? How do we make sure that that's happening in the system also, especially, in, you know, that would be happening in the human system. That's basically the design, uh, the, you know, the 360 design of um, the OPO. So it includes the organizational development piece, the action threshold piece, and then this thing called the sense making up hierarchy. Right. So it's like the, the first two, as you say, like it, by themselves could kind of result in chaos but then the third one the principle of of that kind of sense making uh, for me is kind of about balancing the individual and the collective a little bit like getting exactly. some sort of connection to okay what's this all for what's the purpose of this and is it are yeah. we serving the purpose of the organization by making these decisions it, exactly you know and and so that's exactly right. It's you have to have a way for people at the local level, if they're action oriented, to prioritize according to at least the next higher perspective or what we call strategic whole. It's the next higher perspective. And mm. then that, what happens there has to at least see the next higher perspective. And in a, or even, even in a very large organization, there's not that many jumps up. You know, um, so um, so these are like this is like a hierarchy of perspectives. Just to clarify, exactly. it's not like a hierarchy of management layers, but rather like you're going up the hierarchy. You're kind of zooming out almost and looking more and more at the whole. Exactly. In in the LPO, we talk about strategy as strategic perspectives. Mm -hmm. So strategy is a perspective, and there's different levels of perspective. If you went into a company that built an organization, a fairly large organization based on OPO, you could, in fact, see it as a management hierarchy because over here they're working on a, a higher perspective, you know, but basically what they are is designing communication information flows so that there's this tumbling of the larger perspective from the local information. The reason why they're not managers is that they don't have any uh, disciplinary role over people. Mm. You know, so there's certain aspects of they would kind of look like managers because a lot of times managers are defined by you know that they're working on different time frames and larger strategic perspectives. But they would have no direct reports down the operational chain or something, you know, so that, so if you looked closely, you would see that something's different, but if you just kind of walk through, you might see them as a managerial class. Mm. I, I'm wondering like, you know, for people listening who are working within an organization that, that let's say is more traditionally structured, or at least they're not totally decentralized or self-managing yet. Um, what are some, because I know the last time we spoke, you used this term like OPO moves, that there are some moves you can make. Mm -hmm. So what, what are some examples of OPO moves that people could make in their organizations to start to shift into a more kind of open participatory paradigm, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we call them OPO moves. It's just saying, instead of doing this, try that, right? So, um, and, and in my work, We've experimented with some things that seemed profitable, uh, beneficial. So um, we offer them in training and, and in the book. So an OPO move, for example, is if you are working, um, um, I'll give you something I just did the other day. So I'm working um, uh, with a contact who has a very large project in Washington, DC. And he's constantly, feeding me 
uh, meetings. I'm getting meeting after meeting after meeting because this project's very large and he's getting a lot of people on board. So I feel, I notice there's a power asymmetry because I have a lot more relevant information and knowledge than he does. You know, so this was going on for a little while and it started to get very active. So I said, listen, before we have the next conversation, why don't we meet? And why don't I help you become the lead contact so you can solve more of the conversation right down there in DC with your all these connections you have before then it goes to me, right? So I'm kind of in a consulting relationship. And when I first started working with consultants, they confused me because they would never put me in con connection with their client if they weren't there, right? That's a conventional consultant thing, right? They don't want, they don't want direct access because then they think they'll be cut out because mm -hmm. what is the point if they put their client in direct contact with the person who has the knowledge, et cetera. So this was an OPO move. This was me saying, oh, you don't even have to worry about that. I'm just going to, I'm just going to give you as much knowledge as you can. It's like, the, it's like, it's kind of the opposite, the knowledge bearer, taking them, you know, if I was worried and not open and participatory, I'd be like, I'm the knowledge bearer. Why are they going to need me? You know, I've given them all the things I know. He's pretty much up to snuff so that the whole project's in process. I'm like, you can pretty much at this point make the calls. We're, we're like, we're like right at the same point of this emergent thing and then just keep me updated right so it's kind of this notion of uh what does the system need what is better for the system what is more whole for the system not is what is how can i contract and defend my territory right so that's that was an opo move there's there's that you know um i hadn't thought about it that way but um there's there's just many, many OPO moves. One time, for example, I had a situation where I had a very, very large on-site crew. We ran a very large uh, landscape design building construction company. And the head of the crew every year would come to me and ask, you know, for raises. And these were Latina people and there was a lot of pressure on us because we worked for the rich and famous. And every year over the winter, they would contact our crews and try to steal them. <laughs> and they would give them housing on their beautiful properties and all these packages. They would try to steal them because we had the best crew in the whole Northwest Connecticut. Also, because they were Latina, they had a certain culture where if you gave one a raise, you'd have to give them all a raise. But after a while, it was me not uh, negotiating salary, but competing with my own clients or my own people. So what do you do in this situation, right? So there's a lot of different tenants in the OPO toolkit. One is you uh, want to release complexity. So you don't want to make these moves that start an arms race. So basically, I was an ar in an arms race <laughs> with my employees through my clients. I mean, this was clear to me. So you don't want to make that move. You, that that is um, always comes back to kick you in your butt, and you pay you pay more later. You pay later, but you pay more later. It escalates that. So the other thing that was happening was that I realized that there was what was operating in the system was this tension between the Latino way, where everybody it was more communalism where everybody needed to rise together. And what I was looking at in terms of my organizational budget, my projections, um, how I could uh, justify values and stuff like that. And the key person for me was the head of the, of the, the crew. He was much more complex thinker, much more organizational. The rest of the crew were much more followers. So I had very little insight into how much tension that team would hold if their salary increases started to float. But he did. He 
lived with, I mean, half of them were his family. He <laughs> lived with all the complaining and the this and which ones would stay and which ones would move. He knew more than me which ones were really essential to his job. So I basically moved toward just giving him a budget and he could spread out, you know, here's X number of dollars of raises. You can spread them out however you want, right? Now, this is a sense in which you opened participation, but it was not, it's not like it more, it made more people participate, but it didn't make everybody happy or, you know, it kind of spread out some of this pain, but it took advantage of the local knowledge in the system. And I remember it really irritated the owner of the company because <laughs> the head of the crew took most of the money. <laughs> and by comparison, you know, and he just thought that that was way over valuation for this position. And I said, no, because he is also being paid to handle all the conflict that's now in the system because he's changed that culture, right? So that wasn't really easy. I don't think the owner of the company have ever understood it. I just said, you know, just look at the big picture. Don't look at all these like little strange moves that I'm doing. So this, this is kind of like some of the people that are listening probably they have already understood these are kinds of clever or beneficial moves to make, but it's a typical OPO move, you know? Um, so there's just, there's just, there's just lots of them. Yeah. Something that comes to mind as you're talking about some of these examples is that so many managers or leaders who've been, you know, conditioned for decades in a totally different way of thinking and organizing. So many of them don't even know there's a choice of moves, you know, yes. like I think about a conversation I had once with some managers who were debating how to decide um, how to like distribute um, a bonus, like how to pick which two people would get it in the team. And they were saying, should it be arbitrary? Should we pick at random? Should we do it based on merit? And I asked them, like, have you, why don't you ask the team to decide? Like, why don't they come yeah. up with that criteria? <laughs> and that was just totally, there was just silence then. They totally didn't expect that question and they didn't know what to do with it. So what could, you know, how can we, how can, how can we as individuals start to, I guess, open our minds to the possibility that there are multiple moves that, as you said, like, instead of making this move, kind of stopping in my tracks and thinking, oh, hang on a minute, is there another move I could make, a more yeah. OPO move that would better contribute to the system or, or the thing that we're trying to achieve? Yeah, so I think part of it comes from, I mean, the question is, why don't people in higher positions even come up with those ideas? And if they do, what is it about those ideas that they're very resistant to. I mean, the anxiety is a real thing. The resistance is a real thing. And I think it comes from people not understanding what the actual participation of a manager is in our advanced society today. There's a lot more agency in the employees than they want to admit. And so that makes them anxious, right? And there's a certain level at which they understand that there's a kind of hype or spin in what they're doing, that it's not really real, that they manage to sustain that by the cooperation of the employees who play the game also. So this puts managers in a very precarious position. So just understanding what is the function of a manager, being able to come to terms with that and see that it's beneficial, okay? So, and then, you know, their role would be more to, to continue this flow of participation down through the system, continue this flow of sense making up from the system, you know, that, that they are, have a role to play, um, but they're caught between also conventional expectations also for their, for their role. Yeah, so I think it's about, in my own experience, it's about coming to terms with the fact that action doesn't flow from a manager's decision down. That they, after a certain point in business, you realize 
you're actually part of this this system anyways. You know, if you say something, people just aren't going to, they're not just machines. They're just not going to do exactly what you say. They're going to interpret it. They're going to misinterpret it. They're going to push back. They're going to create subsets. They're going to um, experiment. So, so you realize that there's a constant participation going on anyways. And so why don't I work with what is actually happening, then work with this illusion that the structures are what they actually are. So I think that's that's would be liberating for people in management positions to kind of understand what their role is in 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 the fact that it's a human system anyways. And we did this people's trial once where I put the managers on trial and I said, you have to justify your existence to these 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 workers and they were all agile workers. So you can imagine. <laughs> But it was, it really, you know, I asked for volunteers and it was really good because the agile, the employees level could see that managers were under a lot of stress structurally. And um, eventually um, it helped managers really come to terms. Well, what is my positive role? Like, because I am working really hard, but basically in the workshop, I say that managers or consultants in, in many cases or coaches that we basically do three things number one we we um, regulate the affects of people around us I mean this is a big deal this is like you know life coaches a lot of managers are life coaches um, they're working with the individual the human scale so regulating affects the second thing we're doing is we're adding perspectives that um, are not in the team Right. So if I'm a manager and I'm close to my team, but I'm also close to a leadership team, I can constantly bring those perspectives in. Right. So I'm up leveling perspectives in the team. Um, also, as an outsider, um, I have a perspective that doesn't arise in the team. So I can I can ask naive questions. You know, so this this is a big deal. Um, and the third thing that a manager does, especially in a conventional organization, it's a little hard in, <clears throat> in a more uh, collaborative uh, uh, situation, is they, what I call, make the call the shots. So there are certain times in every organization and every project and every team when analysis will not give you what is the preferred choice. Doesn't matter how much. And then someone, you just have to do something. Because if you do something, then actually you get more information from the environment. And a lot of times that's the manager's role, just to say which direction they're going to do, which choice they're going to take, despite the fact there are no better reasons or more powerful evidence, right? So this is something that we have to remind ourselves in self-managed teams that it's often the case you need you need some kind of process where that also happens or else you just you just fall into analysis paralysis <clears throat> yeah i think hence why a lot of self managing teams you know adopt some kind of decision making framework you know inspired by some of the principles of like sociocracy and holacracy you know good enough for now safe enough to try at some point yeah. you just have to try something right call the shot and then review exactly. it exactly and agile people do a lot of things. They play with poker decks mm. to take the, the anxiety out of it. It's almost like, okay, we're going to use a little randomness, a little intuition. We're going to let the chips fall what they were. So it's collaborative, but um, no one has made the call. No one has to stand out as the person who does that, which is, is both a status thing and a liability because the person now has to do that over and over again. So yeah, there are cool ways in which people... Um, have integrated that need into into these systems, and you, you know, so that's also, you know, it's an agile move, an OPL move. Mm. Bonnie, can you say a bit more about the first one you mentioned about regulating affects? Can you can you say mm -hmm. more about that? Give an example, maybe. Yeah. So um, we all know that when teams work together, people come together. To, to there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of external constraints. And we're emotional beings. And so we have 
primarily um, grown up helping each other regulate their affect. So for example, if you're really sad, then the care urge comes up in me. And then I go and I help you um, with that. If you're sometimes in very sporty situations, if you're angry, then I can, I can like challenge you. And then we get very sporty about our argument. So it's not always dampening, but it's always kind of, where's the place for this emotion to go? We're social beings. Uh, it's very hard for us to sit alone with our emotions, right? So um, we do this naturally, um, but as you get to more and more collaborative environments, you get less dyads. So you'll see in these truly collaborative environments, someone will be angry and they have to sit with their anger. Nobody goes in and tries to help that. Or someone's sad and people witness and presence it, but you don't go over there and you try to regulate each other's affects, right? This is a very healthy collaborative environment. It makes people grow. It creates potential. But that needs to be scaffolded and facilitated. So coaches or managers know how to add a little, a little um, help when it's needed and to allow the system to process, as sociocracy would say, process its own tensions as whole humans. You know, we're trying to make whole human beings. And so this is actually a big part of what managers or coaches or consultants do. It's just that it's never been named. And if we can name it, then we can provide design training programs that make them better exactly at that, right? Mm. Yeah, that's clarifying because I think I made an assumption because of the language, like regulating affects that they're, I think it could be misinterpreted as like, let's suppress that, you know, emotions aren't okay. Let's, you know, kind of um cork that or something but what you're describing is much more like we're human beings these are like living systems we're gonna have feelings we're gonna have tensions there's gonna be situations where you know the whole group might be feeling this and one person feels this and so facilitating and and allowing space for that to be processed for that to be heard for that to be transformed rather than ignored or you know brushed aside so that's that's really key I think and I think that word transforming is really the goal, you know, so I say regulate, that's that's when people usually start by feeling that, but actually the goal is exactly what you said, how you take the positive energy, you know, at a certain point you see, oh, wow, there's so much energy in the system, it's energy for free, hmm. right? That's what we talk about when I teach, you know, so how can I change that from being contracted? This shouldn't be here, I'm overwhelmed with emotion, to, oh my God, this is energy for free. There's so much energy in the system, what can we do with this, you know, as a, as a team? So that's that's the trans transformation. That's an OPL move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's I guess it's like the human body, right? Like if if suddenly the temperature changes, our body regulates to kind of like adjust. Okay, we need to exactly. sweat or we need to do this or whatever. So it it's kind of, it's not a mechanistic uh, move. It's a humanistic move in a way. Exactly. It's a perfect example because we're trying to move to seeing human systems as holistic, right? So part of the regulation is homeostatic. You need some homeostatic regulation in the system so that everybody can anchor themselves in that. And then, you know, let's say you're going to run a marathon. Well, your heart rate might have to go way, way up, right? And so that's far from equilibrium, but the system knows how to have baseline homeostasis around that. So these are good, these are good OPO terms for working in human systems because we want to see them as, as complex, uh, organic, uh, responsive, uh, holistic processes. That's great. Mm, yeah. I wonder if, if that's, if, if we could lead into talking about um, trust practices, because I know that's something that you've written about and mm-hmm. it seems relevant in terms of you know lowering the threshold for action and also in terms of what we were talking about in terms of how those three roles of a manager that you mentioned for example so what is what are trust practices and what are some examples of those yeah it's a great question so I'm gonna I love love how you introduce the body so I'm gonna use that as a bridge and I probably will do that many times now (laughs) so when he, he, people come together as a collective, as a group, 
we were talking about training people to, um, you know, have these homeostatics, but it's also very human and natural and organic. We do it anyways. We're just trying to make it more conscious so we can um, make them more beneficial and not have to be, not have, have to have it be so painful to work these things out in an unconscious way. So trust is something that is a natural uh, emergent pattern of human interaction. And when I do my trust workshops, we basically have people put a little dot in the middle and say, that's you. And then an outer ring, an inner ring and say, you know, who the, who's the people that you trust most? And then a, a second ring. And you'll notice that some people make it into the first ring, but then there's a person you're reluctant to put them in the first ring. They go in the outer ring and you start to actually experience in yourself that there's a, there's a measuring tape. There's a certain natural metric that you're using. Now, it turns out it's very complex. When I first started doing this, I thought, oh, everybody, everybody's gonna have the same metric. It's the one I have. And it turns out there's multiple metrics at play depending upon different contexts. So it, when we do the trust workshop, it's a larger conversation that I won't get into, but it's really fascinating. The point, being made here is that a trust network is something that emanates from each person through everyday ordinary interactions. So this kind of reframes, this is an OPO reframe, because if you're a coach working on, oh, I'm gonna add trust to my team, you can't work at the emergent pattern. You have to work at the lived experience because that's where it emanates from. Now, it turns out that if you do work at the emergent pattern, Many of them will change some of the lived experience, but we can try to go there directly. That's an OPO move because it releases the complexity. So first we see we are all emanating these patterns. We also see that it changes. Like I'll say five years ago, was that different? You know, so there's always coming and going. I uh, just want to make this caveat. When we do our trust network, it's not whether people are trustworthy. It's just what our experience is. Because you'll notice some people that make it very close to your inner circle. Actually, somebody else is in their inner circle and not yours. And this is a great way to triangulate, uh, expand your trust network. You can trust that third person because they made it into the inner circle of your inner circle. Anyways, these are just things we learn about ourselves. The interesting thing in terms of how it works at the collective level is that there are complex feed loops between trust, action thresholds, and power. So it's too reductive to say, like some people say, you know, that, that power and trust are in conflict or um, it's not so clear. They're not just opposites. They can amplify and influence each other in positive ways under certain conditions. They could detract or influence each other in negative ways under certain contexts. So it's all very uh, complex territory. The basic uh, understanding here in the OPO is that the greater the trust in the system, and we talked about what that means, the lower the threshold for action. Now, this is something that's hard for people to understand because many people see that they trust people because they're predictable. And we look at that and say, well, that's actually a low trust environment. If you trust someone only because they're predictable, only because you've contracted and you've made a, like tight agreements, this is actually a low trust environment. Because people will also notice that they'll go like, yeah, but I trust that person and he's crazy person. <laughs> I, you know, I let them do anything and somehow I still trust them. That's a very high trust environment. So the more autonomy you're allowed someone, the more action, spectrum of action you allow someone, it's actually a great, a higher trust environment. So first we have to look at that in this more clear way. I like to say it problematizes some of the blockchain community because they're trying to build transgression less communities. It's a very low trust environment. So this is, this is something, it's an OPO reframe. So first we, we see that, but if you're working in a high trust environment, truly true trust, 
then you are allowing people more uh, wiggle room in the way they behave. And so you're lowering the thresholds for action, right? So it's the same with children. You know, when children aren't trustworthy, you have them on a tight string. And the more trustworthy they are, you give them more money, you let them take the bus, you lower their action thresholds, you increase their potential actions they can take. So in a system, as you're increasing trust in an open collaborative system, then you're lowering the thresholds for action. So that sounds all cool. But what also happens, like how the body has these complex feed loops, as you lower the thresholds for action, you're going to have more hierarchical stratification because in any system, the skill sets are not the same. So when people go off and exercise their skills given permission, you will start to see a hierarchy of skill sets and that will be a power, create power asymmetry. Once you have X amount of power asymmetry in the system, it starts to erode trust. So you have this kind of like wobbly, like a, like a two cycle engine. And so you need a third term, you need a third uh, dynamic, which all human systems have. And that is how then do you work on the power asymmetry? Because you want high trust, you want low th action thresholds, but how do you work on the po power asymmetry? So of course, that third part we talked about, the sense-making of hierarchy helps because you have shared larger narratives, but also skill training, role exploration, um, experimentation with out-of-the-box thinking where people with quote-unquote lesser skills start to actually make a higher contribution. So this is something that we're just beginning to learn how to do, this to, to not contract because it is natural for high trust, low action thresholds, increased stratification. But instead of freaking out about that, you know, and saying, oh, we all have to be equal, we gotta go back to consensus, someone has too much power, um, or conventionally, the people that then, once the, the team stratifies, the person at the top is looking for a management job because they know there's, it's, there's something irritating the system. So we can look at that in a more generative way and say, what can we go in, keep trust high, keep action thresholds low, and address the fact that he, human people at a certain point won't tolerate certain amounts of power asymmetry. It's the same with these experiments they do with the monkeys where, you know, one gets the good part of the grape and the other one gets like, you know, banana peel. And even the monkey in the, in the cage that's getting the grape, once he realizes the other guy, the other guy is getting a bad deal, that irritates them. You mm. know, this is basic human and animal, embodied, homeostatic, you know, a dynamic. Mm. That's really that's really insightful. I like the idea of looking at trust from a lived experience perspective, and instead of trying to add something or you know. Um, it's it's like acknowledging what is currently and yeah. then kind of together exploring well what you know what what do we do with that and what would need to change for the trust to raise the levels of trust in order to lower the thresholds of action but having those three dimensions as well so that it's not because i think so often it's people get stuck in these binary Exactly. Mindsets, right? That it's like, oh, either we're a pyramid, bureaucratic, you know, hi hierarchy, or it's self-organizing, which means no structure, no leadership, no hierarchy. And exactly. it's and it's it's so much more, you know, dynamic and, and complex than that. It's much more so I think those three things are are helpful. And it it reminds me also of um there's this organization in in Scotland called Cornerstone, a social care company. And I interviewed the CEO for the podcast um, some months back and, and they developed this, what they call the Cornerstone Triangle, which is the their three C's. So competence, clarity, oh no, it's not three C's. It's two C's and an A. Competence, clarity, and autonomy. Yeah. But, I, but I can see some parallels there between what you're saying. Cause it's like, okay, if, if there's a tension, if something's getting stuck in the system, Mm -hmm. Is it is it a question of people don't have clarity about what the bigger picture is or, you know, what, what we're working towards or what's needed? Or is it that people don't have the competence and therefore need some more training or, you know, some coaching or whatever? 
Or is it that they don't feel like they have the autonomy to move, right? If the, th- yeah. the threshold for action is too high. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's really helpful to have these frameworks so that we're yeah. not just looking at, you know, a kind of something didn't work and then being like, oh, okay, that was a bad move. We're actually going, okay, well, so let's look at those three lenses. What mm-hmm. happened there? What What can we play around with? Yeah, so you'll see that those three by different names exist everywhere. They're, so in self-determination theory, they're autonomy, relationality, and task, I think. In my work, it's autonomy, relationality, and agency. In their work, the autonomy is autonomy. Clarity is shared clarity, so that's relationality. Competency, that's task. In Dave Snowden's anthro complexity, he's got identity, which is autonomy, um, identity, something like interaction, which is relationality, and intelligence, which for him coming from that uh, field, there's the task, there's always the skill set. Um, you see them, they're, they're everywhere. And so um, it's a very, very robust triangle, very, very robust heuristic to work with because it underlays all these moves. And so, you know, that's why you can trust it because you have people like the CEO intuitively working with the same dimensions. And so underneath here is a pattern, what I call source code for deep code for emergent patterns of human action. It just confirms that these three are fundamental to human systems and people name them in different ways, but they've all point to the same kind of complex dynamic processes. Mm, yeah. I'm, I'm curious about like what's, what's next for OPO. Like, is there a, is there a community? I, I know that you're writing a book at the moment how would you like it to sort of grow and evolve and what is your sort of vision for it? Yeah, so OPO, I think mostly lives as a meme, which I think is great. It's not a closed governance system. It's just a way for people to kind of name what direction they think the future of work is in. So basically my work is in a publication called Our Future at Work, um, what is emerging. So so in, to answer your question, there, there are some people that are starting, a lot of people are doing OPO moves, they call it by different things. Um, there are a few handful of people that have started companies committed to only OPO principles. This is a very big, learning curve, but it does have some very interesting outcomes. I'm not saying benefits, it's not been around long enough, but I have to uh, share you and I, uh, just a story that I go once a year to a company that is committed to OPO principles and we were in this to-do uh, strategic kind of meeting and they were committing to one of my principles. And I was like, really? You guys are gonna lose so much money, you know, in my head, you know? And they were like almost, they were more committed to my principle in this conversation than I was. I could feel myself wanting, well, maybe like at this point, you should just cheat a little, you know? And in that process, they came up with an idea. I can't remember what the scenario was. That was so cool. Like just by using that as a constraint. So you can use, the OPO principles as a constraint because you don't know, well, but isn't there something else we could do, right? So that was exciting to see. And a lot of a lot of what's next for OPO is based on uh, or dependent upon just getting feedback from people trying those exper- experiments. So as we said at the beginning, the OPO is the first part of those three things, how to organize to sense better, I think the second one is pretty easy for people to understand how to lower thresholds for action. So currently I'm heavily invested in the third one and um, I'm working with Dave Snowden and Cognitive Edge has just put out their PSE sense-making um, uh, website. I have been writing my own handbook uh, for the TAP tool will go on their website and be available. So once we can then start, work, it's the only tool that works on those three domains that we talked about that are everywhere. So once we can start automating this through SenseMaker technology, 
we can learn more about how it actually works in the human system. Get, I've done some hand scoring in small communities, but then we can start to receive real time information about human systems. And I think that's where the next level of my work will be. Because, you know, I, I'm, I've been around long enough to know that the model and the theory can get you started, but you need, you need the information coming back this research hasn't been done before. So I think it's really exciting. And then, um, you know, it'll reinform some of our directions. It'll create new ideas and it may uh, improve or revise some of the assumptions we've had at the beginning. So this whole notion, people say, can you clarify what a sense-making up hierarchy is? And I have to say no, because uh, it really depends upon uh, designing technology and we're just at the early stages of that now. So. Um, yeah, so it's very exciting. I can't mm. wait. I can't wait. I'm terrified at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think I heard you say once that um, that the one of the great things about OPO is that it's it's giving a there's an opportunity to create a shared language for a lot of things that people are doing intuitively or you know starting to play around with and and it just i think gives people confidence and and a sense of community and learning together if they're like oh yeah we are trying something like that too oh you're calling it that oh yeah that makes sense and let's be more conscious about it exactly um, and and it, it shows people that instead of arguing about the signifiers what you call it you see oh we're actually doing the same thing and the other day I heard from one of my, I have three people in Stockholm that are how we met, you, you, you know, that's how we met, are uh, working a lot with these principles, these fundamental codes or principles or moves. And one of the benefits is one uh, consultant had was he was with a team and they already had like these, these intuitions, but they went around and around and around and they were using sports metaphors and and the OPO has this term of a location, you know, that there are different locations, different locations have cultures. So he could see that he that they were already kind of working in these terms because they were saying, well, you know, if you play football, there's different rules and it feels different. But then if you play golf, so he said, that's just like how we use locations in the OPO, that you don't have to have the same rules in aligned culture. You have locations. And so it just crystallized. Like they were really brainstorming, but they couldn't see what they had, right? And so if you learn some of the OPO tools, you can collapse that into something that you can show people, ah, oh, you already have this. You just didn't see it, right? So that's cool the way that people are using using some of the some of those tools in the OPO toolkit. Mm. I I always ask guests on this podcast the question you know for people listening who are on a journey towards being a more self-managing organization or perhaps a more open or participatory or conscious organization whatever terms they may be working with you know what would your advice be or perhaps what are some sort of dipping the toe type moves that people could make to start playing around with some of these OPO principles in their context? On Medium in um, the publication Our Future at Work, uh, there's a little article called the OPO Manifesto, and it has some principles that can generate really creative conversations. And so just to start perhaps with using those principles as provocative, uh, that's how the Agile movement started, right? For example, it's based, it, it's set up just like Agile, you know, Agile's process over, or product over process or whatever. People over documentations, I can't remember how it goes, but in the OPO manifesto, it's the same way, access over reciprocity, this over that, more of this, less of that, and just see how that might open open up the system and increase participation. If you move, what would it be to move from, not just get rid of, but move more from this direction to that direction? And just, just I'm hoping that a lot of that reading can give people insights into parts of their days that could use some of that help in a different direction. 
Yeah, but the, the good place to start is with the principles and have a good conversation around that. Even if it's like, oh, hey, that's crazy. <laughs> We would never do that. And then ask, well, what is it? What is it that's that's irritating you? What? Where is the fear arising? What's the risk? Ah, well, maybe that's the problem right there. We're living with risk that unnecessary risk that we don't have, you know. So that's one thing. In people at very large organizations, it's a little tougher because it always comes down to so many people are working full speed, full out, overwhelmed with too much complexity already. So what I work with them, the very first work with them is where can we release complexity? If you can't release complexity in your situation right now, you can't do anything else. You can't start moving around the furniture in your room. So that's a much more difficult challenge if you're already a CEO and you're already kind of in over your head. Uh, But those are two entry points, I would say. The smaller scale, the principles themselves, the larger scale, it's it's a little more difficult. Hmm. So in kind of wrapping up, are there any final words of wisdom or, you know, tips or pointers that you'd like to share with listeners that perhaps you wish someone had given to you at some point? (laughs) Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think most people have a sense that what is real at work and the way we talk about what's happening at work, there's a gap. I think it's pretty transparent now that people know that's true. So, um, but I remember when I first was running, you know, I, mean, I started three companies from the ground up. And that discrepancy was very painful for me. Like, I think, what? Like, why are these people coming in and telling us to do that? It doesn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> but so to trust the lived experience and try to work closer to that, that's, that's the first step because that is really real. But the second is try to have language that more represents the actual experience. Try to move away from the conventional ways of talking about things. Uh, There's this term called K-Fab or K-Fabi, depending upon who you talk to. It's a term in the worldwide wrestling. It means like it's the pretend, like the wrestlers are actually pretending but the audience is willing to pretend also. And that's what sustains the entertainment, really. And so there's something like that that also happens in organizations and true transformation where you wanna go. If you want um, this kind of transformation in the workplace, you have to get closer to talking about what is actually happening and to trust that that's true for everyone. Everybody's living in between this gap between what is real and then the surface thing that goes on as if it were real in organizations. So I wish someone could have told me that, um, like say, look, it's true. There's something kind of crazy about the way we are in companies and in business. There's spin at many different levels. There's a spin you're gonna tell your clients and then you'll realize your own salespeople are starting to believe their own spin. And then you're like, what is that? You know? So if some, if, if management schools could like just prepare people at this level, because it is, seems to be kind of what we do as humans. I think that if someone had told me that it would have, would have been much easier to be confident about some of this as I, experimented my way through 